Uh, thank you very much um, okay. for, for coming. I heard that you were coming from across campus. <laughs> well, no, actually downstairs. Oh, no. I, I, I let my class out early, though. Just so oh, you come and see Oh, that was really cool. Thank they were happy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, I would like to uh, give you a little bit of background on my motivation for the study. Um, uh, the monolithic media myth really came to me um, as I was working as a TV news anchor and reporter for CBS and, and later NBC. Um, I, I, you know, everything I seem to read about the media uh, really, um, or most stuff, not everything, but mo most of the things I was reading about the media really spoke about it in these sort of monolithic terms, like, you, you know, you would hear the reference to the media, and it wasn't, there wasn't any, um, there wasn't a lot of uh, sort of uh, really delving into what is what makes up the media. You know, who who are the people, the individuals that make up this this the media? When you, when when uh, a lot of media studies scholars you know mention the media, so I, I I came up with this term, and also I, I wanted to know if um, my experiences as a TV news anchor and reporter were unique, or are they you know. Um, or were they pretty similar to, to most folks? And I, I found that, that um, uh, some of the challenges that, that I was faced with in the TV news media um, were, were not so bad. <laughs> After I interviewed, um, the, the method that I, I chose was, was ethnographic methods, and so I interviewed uh, TV news anchors, reporters, news directors, producers, writers, talent agents, um, general managers um, of TV news stations, you know, all across the country. And, you know, what I came to find was that um, there, there, you know, definitely is a struggle over um, representation of blackness um, in TV news. And there's, there's many different ways that that, that can be policed. Um, what has interested me, well, so first of all, I, want, I said, okay, I've got to do this, you know, I really want to do this study, so i got to figure out where the archive is. Um, and then, um, I quickly discovered that uh, I had to build my own archive because there was no archive. And I thought, oh man, I would have to choose a project that has no archive, really. Um, so what I did was I, I you know, um, uh, set up, really, I, I sort of went to the various journalism organizations, um, the National Association of Black Journalists, um, being one of, one of the ones that I went to, and the, uh, the uh, National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association, of which both organizations I am a member. And so I, you know, really wanted to, I, I figured that would be a good pool, because from my experience working in TV news, you know, going to these conferences, um, you know, we, we talk shop talk at the book, you know. Um, and, I, and I found that there was a lot of, uh, you know, we, we had similar stories, although they were each quite unique in, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the method that uh, various news directors used to sort of police uh, certain ways of being, so certain modes of, of, of being, um, and, and certain ways of policing this notion of objectivity. Um, um, so that, that, that really, I decided to, to revisit definitely that site because I, I found that that was really a place and space where um, folks who are on air, you know, they feel really comfortable with sharing, you know, their experiences, especially among colleagues, you know, um, where, whereby they, they sort of feel like um, this may not get back to the boss. You know, it may, but, you know, the boss understands that this is shop talk and it doesn't go you know, past this point. So, um, one of the uh, things that I really Want, want to focus on is I basically, you know, interviews are a tricky thing. See, I had to figure out a way because there's certain things that people say in, in an interview that if they slightly change the, the intonation, it could completely change the meaning of, of what they're saying. Um, you know, they're saying one thing, but if the tone changes or if there's a laugh or a chuckle, that, that could completely uh, means the opposite of what is being said. So I took that into account and did a really, um, what I call a really uh, 
thick transcription of uh, when I went back to, to view the, the, the tape. I, I had to, you know, really account for that. And as I was interviewing them, I had to make a note where, where you know, I saw the body language, um, you know, how that communicated, you know, their experience in the newsroom and outside of the newsroom, and what they thought about what was being produced um, in television news, which is very interesting to see it from the inside out. Um, to see, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, the audience thinks this, or, the, um, and which is really helpful and useful in so many ways. Um, Particularly, I, I remember reading uh, Darnell Hunt's um, you know, book, Screening the Los Angeles Riots, and he talked about race ways of seeing. And that really, that was another um, method that was really helpful um, because when I started interviewing the general managers and the, the, the talent agents and the news directors, you know, the, the, the management team, it's kind of hard to get them um, nailed down to something, you know, to, uh, to really say what they, they really feel about, um, you know, things like body image, you know, particularly when it comes to women, um, hiring, you know, black women um, uh, in terms of uh, black men, uh, it's, it's just difficult. So reading Darnell Hunt's book helped me figure out a way to get at what they're really trying to say by, you know, looking at pronoun usage, um, seeing when they uh, use uh, pronouns of solidarity, like me, when, especially with a, a particularly a talent agent who's supposed to be representing the client. Um, when that talent agent began using the term we and speaking about, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, the, we think that, you know, the, the talent should look like this or be like this, that I noticed that he was aligning himself with management and not the client that's paying him. So that was problematic. And, I, and, it, and it immediately, gave me, an, you know, I was able to finish writing my dissertation. <laughs> so that was really helpful um, to, to, you know, really look at that, look at language. And so what I do is I look at Stuart Hall's, um, uh, how he sort of views language. And by language, Stuart Hall says, I mean the language that we speak, the language that we write, electronic language, digital language, language communicated by musical instrument, language communicated by facial gestures. Um, language is communicated by facial expression, the use of the body to communicate meaning, the use of clothes to express meaning, anything, in other words, that gives signs to the meaning that we have in a form which can be communicated you know, to other people. This was really helpful you know, um, in interviewing so many people and, and really having to pay, pay really close attention to the body language that comes along with what they're saying. Um, and so, I, you know, the, the new chapter I have, I've been working on is, I, I, I'm thinking, I'm still playing with titles, but I like to call it the uh, Obama phenomenon. Um, and basically, I am really interested in not only a lot of the images that have come out um, signifying um, blackness and, and Obama in particular ways, um, that are, you know, not just racist, but really speak to um, this sort of policing of what we should view, um, uh, you know, uh, how to define the nation, and in defining the nation and policing what the nation should look like, you know, how we should think about the nation. Um, so I really um, thought that this would be, that that's one, that's one way of, of, of sort of looking at the Obama phenomena. Um, but also, you know, looking at the images, but also interviewing the, the very TV news anchors and reporters um, who cover, you know, who covered the inauguration or didn't, because you know, a lot of news stations don't have very many black TV news anchors and reporters, and the few that they have, they don't assign them the big stories, um, uh, and so that that's that's interesting too to hear the stories behind that story, you know, who. If there's one black person in the newsroom, you know, and why is it that they sent, you know, the white reporter who isn't even a political reporter um, to cover Obama as opposed to, you know, the, the black reporter who has, you know, a history of, of covering politics. I mean, it, it stands to reason, after all. Um, so I, I definitely want to take that approach. I really, I really want to look at um, the, the, the sort of how the newsroom operates as an instrument of domination, 
I really want to look at how the newsroom sort of uh, produces a particularized genre of the human. And, um, and, and I particularly am interested in looking at how um, not just race, but I like to look at the whole person and, and, and look at race, how, how race is uh, constructed, how gender and sexuality is constructed, um, how it's placed and branded. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that placing and branding a little bit later. But um, right now I want to show a few clips um, uh, to which I would love to get your comments. Um, any ideas that you could throw out, I, they're welcome. I would love it. But I want to just run through a, a few clips to take a look at it. And we will, and then I want to go over the other chapters really uh, quickly because I really want to allow enough time for discussion. So let's see if we can. Sorry. Uncovering America Tonight, let's bring back that cartoon we showed you just before the break. It ran in the New York Post today, and it shows two police officers who just shot a chimpanzee. And one of the police officers is saying they'll have to find someone else to write the next stimulus bill. The paper says the cartoon is a parody of Washington politics that plays off the chimpanzee attack in Connecticut. Others see it as a clear racist portrayal of President Obama. We've been talking about race in the comments made earlier today by Attorney General Eric Holder. Let's bring back David Gurgan, Ron Kidd, Christie, and Roland Martin. David, what do you make of, the, of that cartoon? Uh, th does it make sense to you what the New York Post, their explanation of it is? No. Uh, are we having a full moon tonight? Uh, is, there, seems to be, <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be such an odd series of things. We're talking about you know, things that look like so off. Uh, that cartoon is dripping with racism. Uh, you know, and to say anything else is, is to put a gloss on it, but I think it's just not credible. I mean, we all know what the symbol of chimpanzee and baboons and that sort of thing have been used in the past, uh, and, unf and, and unfairly to smear people in the past. With that, that is the history of racism in this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, to, to resort to it now, it just seems to be, I, 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 I don't know what they're thinking about. I don't know where the editors were. Ron, does it, is there any other explanation to it for you? I think there is, and here's where I think I might disagree with my two colleagues on this subject. As a proud black man, I don't look at a chimpanzee as an African American. I don't look at it as a reflection of who I am and who African Americans are in this country. And frankly, <laughs> if it's supposed to be a portrayal of President Barack Obama, the President didn't write the stimulus bill. The bill was written by Speaker Pelosi in the House and by Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. For goodness sakes, we just had a chimpanzee who went nuts yesterday. The Speaker of the House and the majority leader wrote the bill. The President didn't write the bill. The President probably hasn't had time to read the bill from the time it was sent to him in the White House until he signed it. So I don't think this is an indictment of President Obama. Let's just not try to find everything to be a racially insensitive matter. Let's realize also, Anderson, for goodness sakes, President Bush and Dick Cheney were caricatured. They had so many evil comments to say about them. And last but not least, when you had Senator Clinton, who was speaking on Martin Luther King's birthday, and she said the house was run like a plantation, and you know what I'm talking about, and Al Sharpton was right behind her, you didn't hear this human cry from all the Democrats, but now all of a sudden, this is a racist attack against the president. It's ridiculous. Ron, can you not see the reality and the history in this now? When you talk about, in terms of what was there, there was no chimpanzee with a sign underneath it that said Congress, or said Pelosi, or said House Democrats. Uh, and so to sit here and to say that you can't equate the two, no, we understand that there's a history and a legacy. When we talk about caricatures of Bush and Reagan, we also understood the criticism of people who would begin the sexism of Senator Hillary Clinton in the race. There's a history there. There's a legacy there. That's the whole point. Ron, okay, I wrote Rowan. three, I wrote, I, I wrote three newspapers. If a cartoonist came to me with that cartoon, I would say, what is this? What is it, Clay, are you trying to say? Okay, Do you Rowan, understand what this means? Rowan, to have a conversation, and what did it mean when Senator Clinton stood in an African-American church and said that the House of Representatives being run like a plantation, and you know what I'm talking about? You didn't hear any human cry. Excuse me, I didn't cut you off. For goodness <laughs> sakes, Barack Obama did not write this bill. The Speaker of the House wrote this bill. The majority of wrote this bill. And it's, it's just people who are looking to inject race in an issue where I think it's not there. I'm sorry. I also read the, I, I also read the comments of the cartoonist who said that was not his intent. Let's give people the benefit of the doubt as opposed to always finding racial problems in every situation. But, but Ron, would you, would, do, Ron, I hope you would agree. Do you agree that a lot of people would look at that and say, chimpanzee, baboon, 
Obama. They're trying to link all those together. Don't you think, do you not think it's open to that interpretation? David, I think if you look at what happened with the chimpanzee who went berserk in Connecticut yesterday, that's how I looked at it, that's how I interpreted it. It was a very <laughs> timely news event. And Roland, you can laugh at me again. This is a great country. This is not a country. Excuse me, I would not make any personal attack against you, so please don't do the same for me. I think we need to get together as a country and not look at racism behind every corner. For goodness sakes, the cartoonist said that was not their intent. Let's not always assume that there's always something evil lurking behind every corner. I don't, well, don't, find, racism, I don't, find, I don't find racism wrong and everything. But I tell you what, when I see it and I know it, I'm going to call it out. And the cartoonist can explain the way all he wants to. Well, look, people see it for what exactly it is, and that was a racist cartoon, pure and simple. Everybody's got an opinion, okay. but uh, again, everybody's got an opinion. Let's not just jump to judgment. Okay, Let's leave it there. Right. Ron Christie, Golden Martin, appreciate your different perspectives, and David Gergen as well. It's a good discussion. Thank you for being with us tonight. Okay, I want to show another clip. I do want to bring your attention to something that uh, Rick was talking about here yesterday, about a mayor out, in, uh, out in California who sent out a fairly disturbing, and many say a racist, email to several folks, got him in trouble now. Listen to this from Rick yesterday. Let me show you something. Uh, before we do it, Raj, go ahead and put this picture up. This is a picture of someone who's actually a mayor in California. Look at the... All right, you see the watermelons in front of that? This is an email postcard sent by the mayor. His name is Dean Gross of Los Alamitos, California. He sent this as a joke to an African-American activist in his area. The caption, by the way, under this picture, this watermelon patch in front of the White House, says, no Easter egg hunt this year. Funny or racist? Well, let me tell you this. The mayor's now come out and said, yes, it's true when contacted by the Associated Press. I did, in fact, send that. Uh, I didn't mean to offend anybody by it, though. Yes, that's what the mayor said. Again, the name is Mayor Dean Rose of Los Alamitos, California. He is coming out and expected to say something else on Monday. I'm out. He's expected to resign on Monday at a city council meeting after sending out that email. Again, the mayor, Dean Groves, expected now to come out and resign, even though he had apologized for that email he sent out. And by the way, he also said about that email, he had no idea that there was any kind of negative stereotype attached to black people and watermelon. <laughs> and the last clip. Republican women's group says if Senator Barack Obama is elected president, his image will appear on food stamps instead of on dollar bills like other presidents. KCAL9's Christine Lazar reports now from Upland. When I got home and opened up, I literally moved my screen because my daughter was standing on my shoulder and she went, Mommy, what is that? A cartoon featuring a picture of Democratic presidential candidate Barack Obama on a $10 food stamp surrounded by a bucket of chicken, Kool-Aid, rib, and watermelon, was circulated in a newsletter to members of the Chafee Committee of Republican <laughs> Women in the Inland Empire. At least two members of the group are outraged and asking for a public apology. This racial thing and this campaign must stop. These people are drinking the wrong water or something. Like, do you have any comment that this newsletter was racist? No, it's not. The husband of the group's president, Diane Fidelli, says she found the image on the internet. He says he finds nothing offensive about it. Why is it not racist? Because you think that it's racist, we did It's a watermelon, a bucket of chicken. So what? Those are African-American stereotypes. Really? Who says that? You? So what does the chicken and the watermelon and the ribs mean then? Oh, what does the spaghetti and meatball mean? Fidelli's daughter showed up outside her parents' upland home and explained to us why she believes her mother has been unfairly targeted. What many people don't know is my mother was married to my father, who is Mexican. So explain to me how she's racist. Trace and Sue oh. says only one person was offended by the cartoon. Do you think it's racist? Um, no, not exactly. I think a bucket of chicken ribs and watermelon. I eat chicken, I eat ribs, I eat watermelon. But those are, those are black stereotypes. Says who? And for those who say that that cartoon is not racist, how would you describe it? They need to talk to me. Because if they look through the history of the stereotypes that were established for African Americans, that is awful. 
and the two members of the Cheney Committee of Republican Women who are outraged by this cartoon say they worry it is sending the wrong message. They say their group is about philanthropy, not hate. As for Obama's camp, they are aware of this cartoon, but they have no comment. Okay, so the theoretical framework that I had to uh, sort of uh, come, come up with to deal with all of this, um, <laughs> I, Stuart Hall was really, really helpful. Um, Bell Hooks was, was extremely helpful. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, um, Toni Morrison's Blue Aside, because I do engage literature. I think that literature is an excellent way to talk about um, some of the things that, that happen. Um, even though um, uh, uh, you don't see a lot of literature mixed in with, with, with report studies of, of this sort. Um, what I really want to go to right now is uh, Franz Fanon. And with, with this, looking at all of these clips, it made me think about Franz Fanon and what he says in terms of uh, the stereotype. He said, I was responsible at the same time for my body, for my race, for my ancestors. I subjected myself to an objective examination. <coughs> I discovered my blackness, my ethnic characteristics, and I was battered down by tom-toms, cannibalism, intellectual deficiency, fetishism, racial defects, slave ships. On that day, completely dislocated, unable to be abroad with the other, the white man who unmercifully imprisoned me, I took myself far off from my own presence, far indeed, and made myself an object. What else could it be for me but an amputation, an excision, a hemorrhage that, splat, that spattered my whole body with black blood? But I did not want this revision, um, this thematization. All I wanted to be was a man among other men. And this is sort of, I, I use the concept uh, that Fanon uh, speaks of in, in terms of amputation. Uh, it made me think about in many ways that, that black journalists, uh, the minute that they walk into that newsroom, you know, under the guise of objectivity, how many differences they have to check out the door, why, whereas their white colleagues, you know, walk in freely. They don't have to, they, they don't undergo any amputation whatsoever, you know. Um, they just come in as they are. Uh, so I, that, that really stuck with me and really uh, was something that I, that I could use um, extensively, not only in this chapter on Obama, but I found it very useful throughout um, just to talk about the, the um, journalist experience. Um, but fiction, like I said, in nonfiction literature is especially <coughs> to make sense of how black journalists, journalists sort of process their circumstances. Um, as well as how they choose to respond to the institutional constraints they face. Uh, for instance, Ralph Ellison's inner eyes and invisibility uh, speaks to the schizophrenia of having to orient the eyes with a white man's <coughs> heteronormative worldview. Um, the inner eyes guide us to what the dominant culture deems normative. The inner eyes are our guideposts toward performing the human on man's terms. Orienting the eyes may also mean understanding the navigating ones uh, and navigating one's own invisibility in a process of hoodwinking, bamboozling, and leading astray the powers that be who render black subjectivities invisible. The narrator of Ellison's Invisible Man says, quote, to be unaware of one's form is to live a death, end quote, and to, quote, become alive, end quote. One must discover one's invisibility. So the, the process of discovery uh, may also mean orienting the eyes to live to fight another day, as Bob Martin would say. Um, understanding how to use one's invisibility strategically, calling upon multiple personalities when needed, and hey, I, I've had to do that. <laughs> um, the invisible man also sees the power that invis invisibility offers. Um, this research connects, you know, not only Ralph Ellison and Morrison, but um, Du Bois and Ellison's work to discuss the challenges of black journalists, the research links Ellison's concept of the inner eyes with Du Bois's theory of double consciousness as the sense of one's, uh, the sense of looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. Um, the strategy of orienting the eyes, as Ellison would say, becoming aware of one's <laughs> double consciousness shapes the lives of black journalists and the everydayness of struggle over representations of blackness during the professionalizing practice and process, and in the ways their bodies and stories are continually branded and placed. So with that, I would like to talk about this professionalizing and palatable blackness, and I'm gonna take about five more minutes, 
and then I would like to have a, a discussion. Um, but I, I, I really think it's important to look um, at the historical context. Notice, I, I, and this is, I'm just going to see what, what else you all pick up from this, but there is never in those clips, you know, it's like the historical context is just taken out of it. So if you take the historical context of the racial stereotype out, then, you know, then, then it allows them to, to, to say these insane things like the, the woman who said, I eat chicken, I eat this. So, um, you know, I like to, to take into to, to count, you know, um, a historical context, which is why I talk about the branding and placing. I do mean branding. Um, I do uh, put a historical context on branding because, as we know, black um, people, when they were enslaved, were branded with, um, you know, their, their owner's brand. Um, and, I, and I really do seriously look at that in terms of how corporate um, America, corporate television news, um, you know, sort of does their own branding of black bodies uh, in various ways, in the script, by, you know, uh, you know hiring uh, the executive producers who are over the, the other producers, who are usually white, most often male, to oversee the scripts. And um, I do use these terms oversee and, and people who are drivers of the script uh, on purpose. Um, when, I, when I think about you know, how, how the newsroom is structured and how it's run, um, I, you know, not only on the, on the, in their scripts, but also how the branding takes place upon their bodies in terms of the way a black man has to look. You know, you can't, black men have to wear their hair a certain way. Um, most black men just shave it off completely, just don't even want to deal with any bit of kink showing whatsoever, God forbid. Um, and and the, you know you notice you will only see goatees in, you know in sports um, reporting and, and things like that with black women of course you know it just to me it just stands out I had to iron my hair I if I wanted to get a job I had to straighten my hair um, to get that professional look now of course they want to avoid lawsuits so your your news director may not say it you know I've been told oh your hair is too poofy um, by by a news director but that you know he was really crossing the line there. But you know, he had my talent agent, you know, you know, sort of tell me the things that I need to do. You need to straighten your hair, you know, or get it chemically. Get, you know, we, we have people that we can take you to go see for this issue. Um, <laughs> Syndrome. And you know, it's just, it's sort of this branding of the black of the body that doesn't just it's not just limited to 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 the black um, anchors and reporters in the newsroom. It extends beyond. It goes to the Asian Americans who are you know who. You know, get surgery to widen their eyes toward this more European look. Mm -hmm. It goes to you know um, a colleague of mine who um, a Latino male who you know couldn't. I wanted him to fill in as my co-anchor because my anchor was uh, going on vacation, and I wanted him to fill in. And, and the news director said, "Well, for obvious reasons, he can't fill in." And I and I didn't understand. I was like, "What? What are the obvious reasons? He looks great. He's great on the air. He's great live, and he's always on time. He's a great worker." And they said, well, you know, there's a, uh, we're having him, they didn't say exactly who they dance around, they said, well, we're having him see voice coaches now. Mm -hmm. So what it was, was the issue that he has a slight accent. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's not the white Midwestern accent, then it's problematic. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't fit into this sort of particularized genre of the human that they're trying to promote and police mm -hmm. um, in the newsroom. So, you know, it, it, it and it even, I will even go to white women, you know, uh, white women um, immediately go for that, you know, that that bleaching stuff for their hair, you know, lighten the hair. You know, they want to go blonde so they can get that promotion because blonde does equal promotion in TV news. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake about it. When you go blonde, you have more money in your bank account. I mean, I've just found that just across. So it's not just, you know, I really want to point to the pervasiveness of this, of racism um, in my work. Um, and so, so it's it's something that that really uh, it's, a, it's a problem that that is systemic. Is what I'm saying. Um, so I definitely talk about that, um, and I talk about um, you know uninhabitable blackness, um, and I also use Franz Fanon's um, uh, ideas about uh, you know when you think about having to you know we're so busy trying to survive you know and thrive in this world that we don't often, we don't have the luxury 
to take the time to think about the psychic and symbolic violence that this does. We don't have the time. You know, we're so busy, you know, um, just trying to make it that we really don't take the time to, to, to really look at it. And I, and I really do look at it as um, psychic and symbolic violence of, of the professional violence of, of the professionalizing practice. And I, I um, think it's really important to get at that. And to get at, you know, to really look at that and examine it and analyze it, you have to go to the historical context. Um, uh, I also, so in chapter, so that's chapter one and chapter two, um, you know, where I talk about also, um, you know, some of the, the, how white reporters and producers, um, you know, sort of like the hijacking of blackness, you know. Um, white reporters get to cover everybody. But if you're black, you know, you're kind of, you, you go cover those black stories in that black community over there, you know. You, can, you don't get to tell the big story or cover the big story. So um, I talk about that in terms of placing blackness um, in chapter uh, four, because uh, branding and marketing blackness goes hand in hand with then placing um, uh, blackness. And I, and I don't mean just placing blackness in terms of story assignments. I'm talking about placing blackness in terms of the newsroom, you know, everybody knows that the graveyard shift and the weekend anchor shift are known as the ghetto shows. That's where you place your, your black talent. Um, I've been able to, I, I didn't have to work the graveyard shift. I um, hired a, I hired a um, agent to try and get me, you know, on a much more visible shift. Uh, so they put me on the, the early morning, 5 a.m., you know. Wow. <laughs> well, I don't know who's up that early, but, um, but yeah, so I mean, it's, it's interesting how blackness is placed in the newsroom, in the uh, story assignments, but also geographic placing of blackness. I've had reporters tell me, you know, I've gone on an interview with, with a news director, and they said, well, you know, your, your resume looks good, your tape looks fabulous, you, you do a really good job with the live shots, but you know, why don't you try getting a job in Detroit or, or you know, maybe even DC, DC's a big town, you know, you, you might want to try there. You know, there, there's black people there. You know, as if, um, you know, as if a, a black reporter can't, you know, the audience wouldn't be able to, to somehow comprehend the, 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 this, the job that they're doing or they wouldn't be able to relate to this reporter as, you know, someone that they could invite into their, their living rooms to, you know, every evening for the, for the evening news, prime time hours. Um, so I, I talk about, you know, placing blackness in, in a few different ways, spatially and temporally, um, placing of blackness. Um, I also talk about the totalizing quest of the it factor um, and how that affects uh, black news anchors and reporters. Um, <laughs> Black mobility and dominant imaginings is a part of this sort of placing of blackness that, that, that I speak about um, and that I um, analyze in chapter four. Uh, and also the hypocrisy of population parity. Um, and then in chapter five, I talk about the rules of engagement, the politics of race, gender, and sexuality, um, the don't ask, don't tell, and other strategies of containment. Um, you know. It's interesting, you know, you can, you, can, it, you can work in TV news. I interviewed a, a man, he was you know, black gay male, who just couldn't understand why he couldn't get a spot on the anchor desk, why he couldn't get a job anchoring. And he did say that, you know, he felt like it just has to, something to do with the white, straight, the, the straight white guy in the office, you know, who makes all the decisions. And you know, while people in the newsroom knew that he, you know, was gay, people in the community did not, because the station wanted to sort of uphold a particular image um, <coughs> that sort of panders to this, you know, heteronormativity and um, this particular um, way of thinking of the human, um, this particular notion of the human. I also talk about, um, you know, the house of difference, um, the sexualized body, psychic violence of heteronormativity. But I also talk about homonormativity because, and I speak about it in terms of the uh, journalism organizations uh, that I, you know, I, like I said before, I'm a member of the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association and the National Association of Black Journalists. Um, I found <laughs> going, you know, to the NLGJA conferences, I would look across the room and I'd be like, where are black people? 
Matter of fact, where are the women? You know, there's just no, I mean, there were, it was an organization at that time of predominantly white men um, who had their little niche, you know, as, you know, their niche of minority status, you know? And that's how it, that's really, I mean, it's interesting how people are privileged, in a privileged position to pick and choose, you know, um, what they will focus on, you know, if, it, if it'll affect them. So I, I talk about homonormativity in terms of, you know, what do you do when, you know, you, you, you want to look for an organization to support you in this cutthroat business, and trust me, it is very cutthroat. What do you do when you go, you, you seek out these organizations and you just can't really find that level of support where they are willing to, to, to see all of you, not just your race subject, not just your sexual, you know, just all of you. Um, uh, NABJ has gotten better, but NABJ had, you know, you know, they would push to the margins, you know, the, 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 gay, the gay journalists, the LGBT journalists, you know, wouldn't really, they wouldn't have any panel discussions, any sort of support networks for, for that group. You know, and so now, of course, they've sort of taken it with new, um, when, when the last two presidents came on, it just, you know, they, they had, uh, created a task force, um, LGBT task force, and so they've gone full speed ahead. Meanwhile, NLGJA um, still has uh, quite a ways to go. I hate to say it, but they have quite a ways to go in terms of, you know, uh, really looking at things in a more broader way. Now I better wrap this up. I um there's there's a little bit more but I'm gonna end it here because I really would like to get your comments and um, any questions I would love it so fire away. I'm going to show you some some images as we have these discussions that maybe we can um, that I didn't show earlier but that we can discuss. So, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, are you doing? Are you currently doing interviews with journalists, or are most of your interviews you were referring to interviews you did in the past? Um, I'm currently doing interviews with journalists, okay. but I mean most most of uh, them are interviews from the past. But I I follow up. Literally just started. Yeah, following up with. Them. Okay. The, the reason I'm asking is because um, I'm just curious to see if you noted any changes in terms of. Um, I guess the climate in newsrooms, in terms of these issues of objectivity and sort of amputation of one's racial identity, now that there's a quote unquote black president in the White House, right. and how what's normative and what's considered normal may be shifting, or maybe it's not shifting, maybe it's being reinforced in relation to that. I'm just curious to know whether you've noticed any differences. We're in an amazing time right now. I mean, seriously. I really mean that seriously because. Now, at this time, a lot of the, you know, NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN, all these stations, what they're finding is that their ratings and revenue are plummeting. Mm -hmm. People are just tuning out. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know what? You're not supplying, you're not, you're not offering me the service that I need. You're not giving me the news and information that I, you know, and I can't even relate to, to, mm -hmm. to this format of the, that goes back to when TV just first started. Yeah. I mean, we really haven't come very far. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of what you you know how the newsroom is structured and and what goes on in there. I mean we really have it. Mm -hmm. So there for, because and it has nothing to do with that. The reason I say this is because the motivation now to take to re, to take a, another look at how they're doing things is because their ratings and revenue are going down. Mm -hmm. um, so so they do have that as a motivation. That being said though, you know it's slow. It's slow, it's slow to get, you know, it's one thing to realize, oh, ratings and revenue are going down. Now they're just locked, what do we do? Mm -hmm. they, and, and it just doesn't, for some reason, mm -hmm. come to mind, oh, we need to look at, you know, diversity. Mm -hmm. We need to, it just, for some reason, mm -hmm. even with a black president, it just doesn't click. They're, they haven't made that connection. We're really in a transitional moment here. Um, you know, it, the reason I say this is because, you know, when I went, I went to the inauguration, and I didn't see many black reporters covering it. And I started calling my, you know, the reporters that I know that I've, I've, do, I've interviewed, and they were like, "Well, no, you know, that, you know, because of the budget, mm -hmm. because you know we're, you know, the, we're, 
you know, really hurting. They could only send so many reporters, and they had, and um, you, and one of them said, just said flat. And that was really diplomatic of that person to say when I called them. But the other person was like, girl, you know, they're not going to send them black people out to cover the big story like that. You know, I mean, it's just they haven't made the connection. And to me, it, it would be a no-brainer, especially if someone's a, is known for doing political reporting. Why wouldn't you send them out, mm -hmm. regardless of the race? I mean, and they happen to be black, but so. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, many years ago, my daughter you know, worked in a, a public affairs, and also had friends who worked in news. And uh, my mentor was uh, the first black woman uh, to be in any kind of local station. And uh, anyway, but what I was doing initially was cataloging videotape kind of audition tapes for people that wanted to be uh, anchors or talent on this magazine show, which, you know, which is now proliferated, but I told you this was one of our pictures where it started. And what I'm getting at is this kind of um, dehumanization that certainly takes place when we're talking about black people, that takes place with all people who are talent, or at least it did. So what I'm really trying to get at, though, I mean, I'm to uh, make the question shorter than I would normally is that when you're in a business that looks at people as meat, that looks at people in a dehumanized way, everybody except for white males, but even to some extent it's been that way, then how do you uh, how do you tease out what is the, 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 the kind of black amputation versus the, you know, and you've already talked about trying to bring the whole person in. How, you know, uh, so ultimately what you want to get to is, and I, don't, I certainly am not advocating, you know, ignoring uh, uh, race and color and appearance and sexual and so on. But but I'm saying when you do the analysis that you're doing, how do, in a business that doesn't look at someone as a whole, how do you methodologically <laughs> really separate the two things and separate the general dehumanization from the dehumanization that you people? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent, yeah, because. And did you struggle with it? It, it was, it, you know what, it, it's, it's difficult, it was difficult because, it was difficult to get people to talk about it the various ways that they, you know, are, are sort of marginalized in the newsroom. I mean, it really was. I mean, one of the, um, one of the women that I interviewed, um, black woman, lesbian, she, uh, she was so torn, you know? On one hand, she was angry, you know, um, with, you know, the, the station for not promoting her you know, the way she knew she should have to be promoted, when they promote people with less experience. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, she was, you know, she, and she wanted to get support from her organization, you know, NABJ, but she didn't find them very useful. And then when she goes to NLGJA for support, well, they don't really find, um, you know, her issue um, really a priority, you know? So how do I talk about that you know, how do I, how do I sort of, so what I, what, basically what I, that's why what I had to do was I literally, I had to, um, I didn't want to paraphrase. I really had to stay away from, para I, and I know that that's done a lot just to make it, you know, the flow, but I really needed to, for people to see in, in her words, you know, this sort of tension and this struggle, this sort of, um, what, uh, Richard Wright, uh, when, when talking about uh, Native Son, he, he talks about this sort of no man's land. You know, this feeling of, of just, you know, this, this no man's land. You, nowhere is your, you, you know, you don't feel really comfortable at, or at home anywhere. And I really, and, and it, well, I had to borrow from Richard Wright to really be able to, to talk about that. And, and, you know, methodologically, I had to, um, that's when I had to come up with something more than just transcribing, you know. Um, I had to come up with, I had to really point to the, the, the body language and when, when you could see the struggle and you could see, you know, I, I, I wanted to record, you know, um, you know, when she would, when she, you know, broke out into tears and started crying in the middle of the interview because no one had ever bothered to ask her how she feels about how she's treated. You know, and it just sort of hit her all at once. And, I mean, I had to, I wanted to include that in, in the transcription because I think you have to, you really have to um, get at that 
you know, that piece because if you just look at, you know, just the words, you're going to miss it. You know, so methodologically, I had to really pay close attention to detail, which was really grueling. And if any of you have ever done transcribing, mm -hmm. it is hell. <laughs> it is not. It's it's really it's te you, I mean, it's tedious enough to have to transcribe the words that they're saying, but then you have to go back in your notes where they said the words in the, in the, when you're transcribing and go back in your notes, okay, what body language was going on then? Because during the interview, I'm writing down the body language too, you know, with my notepad. So I had to map that over onto to the text, you know, which is really interesting. I mean, it's, I spent hours and then, and, and I couldn't hire anybody to do that because who's going to do that? No one wants to, they're like, are you kidding me? You're going to have to pay me more for the, to do something like that. I mean, it's really involved. So. I had to do all the transcribing myself, which I do not like transcribing. I don't like it at all. Um, but methodologically, that's what I had to do to sort of get at that tension, that that sort of you know triple consciousness, which is what Audre Lorde talks about. You know, Du Bois talks about double consciousness, but Audre Lorde, um, you know, talks about triple conscious consciousness um, uh, and sort of dwelling in in sort of the house of difference. You know. You know, Audre Lorde it has this one um, thing that she says where, you know, um, you know, my place wasn't, you know, um, amongst, you know, white lesbians. My place wasn't, um, you know, amongst um, the black community. My place wasn't, you know, um, amongst this group or that. It took me a while to figure out that my very place, the very place that I dwell is the house of difference. This is my house. This is, and I have to make this a home some kind of way. And that's where the struggle comes in. So. One, one, one quick follow up. I mean, you, you used some very good uh, clips there in the first, first section of the Watermelon Pass and And the response that the people made in defending themselves was to basically not be colorblind, but to color the gay. They were negating. Right. That's negating the color, negating race. And yes. so this seems, and, and Christy does this stuff all the time, that, that particular spokesperson. This seems like a strategy on the part of these conservatives to not allow people of color to defend themselves using the issue of color uh, while they're being attacked mm -hmm. as people of color. Mm -hmm. So I'm, just, I'm glad you did that. But I yeah. just that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, one comment and then a, a question. I think a lot of what you say you know, is evident in, I think, the case of Robin Roberts. I don't know if you consider her to be a journalist or a news person or not. The one on, what is it, Anchor? I don't know what you yeah. call her. Okay. Yeah, she, yeah. All right. she does it all, really. Um, but, you know, there's been an interesting kind of transition today. I mean, when she finally got to be able to do stories that were meaningful to black folks, right? Really, it was Katrina that... That really, yeah. To because who else could have gone down there and done what she did in, in Mississippi? And then the whole thing was there. Now, I don't know if you could get cancer. To be able, and let me tell you, you I, yes, you, I think you have to get cancer right. in order to be right. able to but wear your hair naturally as a black woman. Yes, because she said, you know, I talk to everybody, and you know, first it was, you know, the bald, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then, right? I mean, it was a major announcement. So obviously, you know, she had to get permission. She had to talk to people. She definitely, I believe you mean she had to talk to yeah. her news director, the general yeah. manager, the image consultant, the owners of the state. I mean, there was several conversations going on and they felt like well it, it's kind of okay it makes us look you know yeah like, like we're like we're, you know we're, we're forward thinkers yeah you know it, right she had to get cancer in order for us to allow her she had never gotten cancer she would never have gotten to that point i am positive no. yeah right i'm pretty sure that yeah. as well right uh but the question has to do with whether or not in in your book you're going to analyze the, the special case of, of the black conservative i mean there seems to be a proliferation and i guess the cynical part of me sees them as seeing that it's easier to make it that way exactly. right because there's so few of them right but but now, i don't know if they're few now. anymore right <laughs> that's really marks and growing they find yeah. they seek them out they do like, they what? seek them out and they have them in the Rolodex and they know when they want that other side, pull that, pull that conservative black person. He'll always, you know, he'll bring it home for us, you know. And they always, that that's, um, and yes, they unfortunately, this is the thing. Yeah, they, they, they are in few in number now, but they're starting to grow. <laughs> because they see an opportunity yeah. to make money and to, to become successful in that way. Have you interviewed them? I haven't. I can't. Oh. Yeah. You can't bring no, them. I can't wait. No, I, I would like to. There's a couple that I actually have in mind. Oh, good. Yeah. My question is, 
questions about when you were talking about the only time maybe facial hair on men is allowed is in maybe in sports, and I don't know if you have a chapter on sports because what it makes me think of is I can't even stand to watch most of these ESPN sports shows anymore because of the appropriation of hip hop culture language. <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. that's the and I was gonna do that, but that's a whole nother that's a, a whole, maybe it's a that's a book. That's a book. Maybe, yeah. 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 Because it's deep. Because it's really deep to me and I you know and I find that this it's 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 acceptable and it's it's the white man who can do it the best there, you know, what they think is the best. I find that they sound ridiculous and get on the nerves, right? <laughs> but I think that that's the only time that a black person is allowed to to be, you know, without the Midwestern accent, without the, you know, it's the only time hip hop culture is, is used in the, in the media or mm -hmm. the language of young people. And I just thought that that was just interesting. It's sort of, you know, appropriating blackness, right? right? right. And it's sort of this commodification of blackness, right. you know, that, that the news media uh, tends to do. Um, you know, I tell you that I, I thought about doing covering sports because I did interview some sports people in sports, um, uh, anchor, sports anchor and, and reporter. But I, I just, I found that I would not be able to do a good job. With, you know, I it would it would take a whole nother book project because it's it you know the deeper I got into the interviews, I was like, wow, okay, so it, there actually has to be way more done um, in this research. Then I have you know time for so, and my my other actually I my other I have another project that I'm working on another book project, um, it, and it speaks to sort of this this you know these clips uh, where I talk about the Confederate flag as a legitimized issue of controversy in the TV news media, um, because you certainly wouldn't consider it a legitimate issue of controversy if it was the swastika for sure, I guarantee you that you know that that wouldn't happen. Um, but, but what I heard over and over in, in interviewing uh, white TV news anchors and reporters who were born and raised in the Deep South who, who really feel strongly that the Confederate flag should fly, um, you know, they speak of it, they take the historical context out, which is always the, the norm, that's what they all do, because you can't do that, right? Um, but, but they speak of it in, in they, they construct it as a, in, a, in effect as a memorializing function, right? Well, my grandfather died for the Confederacy. Don't I have the right to memorialize, you know, or, or to mourn his, his death and to celebrate, you know, his, his accomplishments? You know, you know it, I, and when you say, yeah, but um, the Confederate flag symbolizes rape, murder, theft, kidnapping, um, you know, you, they, they just don't want to think of Grandpa in that way, you know, or great Grandpa in that way. And so, you know, it's sort of the same, similar thing that's going on with this Confederate flag um, issue in the TV news media, because they talk about it as if it's a legitimate issue of controversy. Something that isn't even on the table for discussion, but apparently it is because it's still flying in a lot of our states here in the great uh, U.S. of A. So it's five after. Um, I would love to take more questions, but maybe um, I'll take them after. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for coming, everyone. I really appreciate it. And those of you that drive a long way to come, <laughs> check it out. Um, I really, really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.